Okay, let's get started with this incredibly high resolution <laughs> uh, map of Asia, just to orient ourselves so we all know what we're looking at. Modern China in red, modern Vietnam in green, modern North and South Korea in blue, and modern Japan in orange. These are the areas we will be talking about today. Um, before I go further, I just want to briefly acknowledge that we are living and working on the land of indigenous people. And we like to take the opportunity of talks at the University of Washington to remind ourselves of this important fact and try to remain mindful of it as we move through our daily lives. Here's what we're going to do today. Um, we're going to talk about the invention of Chinese writing and a little bit of the history of the Chinese character script. We're going to talk about how Chinese characters function. I'm going to introduce two technical terms and only two in this lecture and morphogram is one of them. We'll bust a few myths about Chinese, um, and then we'll get to the heart of things. We'll talk about how Chinese characters are learned and borrowed, and uh, I'm going to involve you all in a little bit of an experiment, so you've been fairly warned. And then we will talk about early Japanese, Korean, and Vietnamese writing, and we are somehow going to do all of this in 50 minutes to an hour. Um, and you'll enjoy every minute of it, I promise. Okay, um, and suddenly my clicker isn't working anymore. Are you doing something? Oh, okay. Is the video working now? Should we, should we check it before we go on? No, let me, let, let's fix it. Let's just take a second. So, okay, got it. Okay, then we'll keep going. Okay, so I want to start by talking about the difference between speech and writing. Human beings have been speaking to each other for about 100,000 years, but writing has only existed for about 5,000 years. So for most of the existence of our species, we have only been using language in oral or signed form. Writing is a new technology. The invention of writing was a transformative event in the history of our species that completely changed the way that our societies could be organized and function. It's very hard today for us to imagine a world without writing because it's so important to us and it's embedded in our everyday existence. But it's important to remember that writing is not something that has always existed. It is something people invented. In fact, people have invented writing, as far as we know, based on the historical and archeological records we have, four times, just four times. Now, okay, you may be saying, wait, wait, how can, that, how can that be? Because after all, didn't the ancient Greeks invent the alphabet in the 8th century BC? Didn't great King Sejong of Korea invent the Korean alphabet in the 15th century? Didn't Chief Sequoia invent the Cherokee syllabary here in the United States in the 19th century? What about the Barry brothers who invented an alphabet for Fulani, a language spoken by millions of people across Western Africa in the 1980s? And of course, you can think of hundreds and hundreds more examples of writing. But I'm not talking about this kind of invention. I'm not talking about the invention of a way of writing a language by people who already know that writing exists in the world. I'm talking about the idea of writing. People inventing writing in the absence of any knowledge that such a thing is possible or has ever existed. That is a very, very powerful idea. And as far as we know, it's happened only four times. Does anyone know what the first invention of writing is in human history? You can raise your hand. I've got a red t-shirt with some yellow on it. Just one, please. Very good. 
Sumerian cuneiform. How many years ago? I've actually given you the answer already. 5,000 years ago in Mesopotamia, Sumerian speakers invented writing that we now call cuneiform. It's wedge-shaped. What about the second invention of writing? Someone else. Yes. Chinese is not the second, but we'll get to it. Any other ideas? Yes. The Indus Valley script is not proven to be writing, so we don't yet include it. There is a possibility it is a fifth invention of writing, but we don't know yet. So that's very good. Yes. Egyptian hieroglyphs very soon after the invention of cuneiform writing and not too far away, the Egyptians invented a form of writing that we call hieroglyphs. Number three, any takers? Uh, yes, right, go, go for it. Mm, no, we're not there yet. <laughs> we still need number three, someone else? Yes, back there. Chinese, a thousand years, uh, 2,000 years later. Oh, why isn't my, you were messing with me again. <laughs> okay. <laughs> there we go. Chinese characters. Nearly 2,000 years later and far away, the Chinese invented, without knowing anything about the existence of writing, their form of writing that we call Chinese characters. And now, in the front row, what's the fourth one? Is it ancient Mayan? It is. A thousand years later in Central America. Um, not actually Mayan, but probably pre-Mayan peoples like the Olmec uh, invented writing again independently. And that's it. Four times. And there's only one of these four that is still in use today, in unbroken, continuous use to the present day. And that, of course, is Chinese. Yes. Now, that doesn't mean Chinese is better or more successful because Sumerian and Egyptian were also in continuous use for about 3,000 years. It's just they got a head start. <laughs> so they've been out of use for about 2,000 years. We'll see if Chinese characters end up uh, beating them by a significant margin. Well, we won't see, but someone hopefully will see. Okay, just to give you an idea of the geography, Sumerian here in modern day Iraq, Egyptian here in modern day Egypt, Chinese in China, of course, and Mesoamerican in Central America. Okay, and this is the approximate area that was under the control of what we now call the Shang Dynasty, where writing was invented. And the earliest Chinese writing we have are divinatory texts that are carved into cattle, scapula, shoulder bones like this, or the belly plates of turtles. And they record interactions between the king of the Shang and his deceased ancestors. And after they were carved, they were stored, and then they were buried with the kings, and they came to light about 120 years ago, after being unknown to the world for um, well over 2,500 years. Um, this is what the earliest Chinese writing looks like. Chinese writing like the other four writing systems, does have its earliest origins in what are originally pictures, but very quickly moved beyond pictures because pictures alone are not sufficient to record the entirety of a spoken language. Even this writing um, is clearly not entirely pictorial. It is somewhat stylized. As you look at it, you may see some things that are clearly depictions of real objects, but also many characters on here that are not obviously pictures of things. Um, you might see this. This, in fact, is a picture of something, although it's rotated 90 degrees. Uh, it's a picture of a horse. And it is, in fact, the ancestral form of this modern Chinese character for horse. But it would be a mistake to think that all Chinese characters originate in pictures this way. In fact, only a few hundred 
of the thousands of characters in common use are directly derived from pictures of objects. People who study Chinese characters, who have learned Chinese characters, who know about the history of Chinese characters often recognize a pictorial quality, but it's not there in modern Chinese writing. If you show a bunch of characters like this to someone who has never had exposure to them before and ask what they are pictures of, you are going to get some very interesting responses. Two of these characters do in fact originate as pictures. Two of these characters do not. Many of you will know that the top left one was originally a picture of a dragon. Some of you might know that the top right one was originally a picture of a cloud. But the characters for taxes and exercise, although very old, are not pictures of taxes or exercise. Uh, and in fact, it's, it's not too hard as you think about how you might write down every single word and grammatical component of spoken English, that pictures are not going to get you very far. So there are a lot of aspects of Chinese writing that are not pictorial, and that's also true of Egyptian writing, Sumerian writing, Mayan writing. We're not gonna spend more time on this, even though it's really interesting. I wanna talk about how Chinese function in the way they represent spoken language today, which is essentially the same way they have functioned for the past 2000 years or so, and is relevant to the main topic of this lecture, which is the borrowing of the script uh, across East Asia. Chinese characters do not write individual sounds, nor do they embody representations of pure meaning. They are what we call morphograms, which means that each character represents a unit of speech that we call a morpheme. What is a morpheme? A morpheme is a building block of a word. The morpheme is the smallest component of a word that is indivisible and has sound and meaning. So if we look at some English words, these all contain more than one meaningful part. They all contain two morphemes. Cats is made up of cat and a plural suffix. Laughing is made up of laugh and a verbal suffix, which carries meaning. Driver is made up of drive and the er suffix, which means the agent of an action. Classroom obviously is made up of class and room. All of these are morphemes. If English were written in a similar way to how Chinese was written, there would be a distinct character for each of these eight morphemes. Let me show you, I will give you an example in a moment of, um, that will help you understand this concept. So it's very different from alphabetic writing, right? In alphabetic writing, you have letters that represent individual sounds. The letter B represents the sound B in any word. It doesn't matter what the word means, the letter B doesn't care. Syllabic writing, like alphabetic writing, is purely sound-based. This graph here writes the syllable mi in Japanese, and it writes that syllable in any word, regardless of the word's meaning. But in morphographic writing, like Chinese characters, each unique spoken combination of sound and meaning together gets written by its own character. So if English writing were morphographic, and would be written with one graph, not three letters. And actually, we do have a morphogram that writes and. English writing is mostly alphabetic, but we have a few things in English writing that are very much like Chinese characters. And the ampersand is one of them. You think about the ampersand. It writes something pronounced and, and that means and, and only that. It does not represent the sound sequence and, because if it did, I could use it to write the word sand or my name handle, but we don't. We don't use it that way. And if it just meant and with no particular pronunciation, then I could read this as Harney plus sons, but I can't. That only means and only writes the particular word with a particular pronunciation and. That's a morphogram. 
That's what Chinese characters do. So let's let's look at some. Let's look at some Chinese characters. And since I've got you all trapped here, we'll do a, a Mandarin Chinese lesson. Okay, so left column are five Chinese characters with their pronunciations in modern standard Mandarin. And uh, you can repeat after me. <laughs> shi. Yeah, it's got a rising tone. Okay, time. Shi. Oh, that's great. The tones are fantastic. Okay. Eat. Shi. Yeah. Stone. Shi. Solid. Shi. Okay. There are five different morphemes. They're homophonous. Just like in English, we have bear, the animal, and we have bear to withstand. They're completely unrelated words. They have different meanings. They're pronounced the same. These five are pronounced the same, but they're distinct morphemes, distinct combinations of sound and meaning. Each one gets written with its own character. Okay, same over here. The Tang Dynasty. Tang. Louder, louder. Tang. Oh, good, good, good. Okay, Hall. Tang. Sugar. Tang. Dyke. Tang. Yes, okay. So these also are homophones. They're distinct in their meaning. They get written with different characters. They are not necessarily all words, but they can combine to form words because words are made up of morphemes. Just like classroom, just like driver are made up of meaningful parts. The word for dining hall is made up of the morpheme shi meaning eat and the morpheme tang meaning hall. And so it's written with the characters associated with those two spoken morphemes. So we have shi tang. We also have another word, edible sugar, that's pronounced the same, shi tang. But in this case, the second morpheme means sugar, not hall. And so it's written with the character associated with sugar. So this is the way modern Chinese writing works. And it's the way Chinese writing has worked to write Chinese for at least the past 2,000 years or so. OK, so now we're going to do a little thought experiment. I want you to imagine that you speak English. You use English every day in speaking, but you are in a society where you have never seen or imagined writing. So you live a purely oral existence. Everything you do to communicate using language is through spoken language. And then one day, you travel to this place where you see something really weird and magical happening. You see people making shapes on paper and other people looking at the shapes on paper and all speaking the exact same sentences out loud every time they look at it. A perfect preservation of a sequence of words. Unbelievably useful. An entire story could be written down and read back in exactly the same way at different times and places by different people. So this seems incredibly useful. So you might want to learn to do that, right? But it would not occur to you to try to do that with your language. You would ask the people you see doing this, what does that mean? How is that pronounced? How do you do that? How do you write it? and you would start to learn Chinese. That's how you would become literate, is by learning the Chinese language, learning the spoken language and its written representation. Because that's the only writing you see and the only writing you can talk about. To do that, you end up studying the vocabulary words in spoken Chinese, the grammatical patterns of spoken Chinese, and the Chinese characters that are used to write those words. So you have to memorize a lot of Chinese characters in addition to your knowledge of the structures of the Chinese language. How do you memorize thousands of characters? How are you gonna do it? You're an English speaker. You're an adult, you didn't grow up with Chinese. How are you gonna learn all these languages? Well, I mean, all these characters. Well, you're gonna do it actually the same way that students learn Chinese as a foreign language today you are going to look at the characters and for each one, you're going to memorize how you pronounce it and what it means. 
and you're an English speaker. So what it means for you is going to be a translation into English. This is exactly how I learned Chinese characters when I was in college. So the way you learn this character is you look at it and you say to yourself, your teacher tells you how it's pronounced and you say to yourself, si. go ahead, si. okay? And then you think four. Okay, next time I see this, I have to remember. Pronunciation si, meaning four. This one, yu, two. This one, I, love. This one, she, dream. And thousands of others. It's a lot of work. You have to memorize them. But you can do it. And the way you do it is you associate a sound value which is your imitation of the Chinese pronunciation. Maybe you have a terrible English accent, that's okay. And a meaning, which is your translation into English. And those two things are stuck in your brain with the shape of the character. So let's focus in on this character. You've basically got a mental flashcard. This is what I did in writing when I was learning Chinese characters, I made flashcards. On one side, I had the character shape. On the other side, the pronunciation and the meaning. And I worked on memorizing them. In our thought experiment, you don't know how to write. You can't write these things down, but you're doing it in your head. You're associating a pronunciation and a meaning with each character. Okay, now let's suppose you're not the only one. There's a bunch of you, English speakers, have made their way to China and you've all learned to read and write Chinese because it's so useful, which means you've memorized thousands of characters and you've all done it the same way. So for this group of English speakers, you all associate the same pronunciation and meaning with all of these characters. And how do you read and write? If you want to express something that you would naturally express in English, you translate it into the Chinese language you've learned you write down the translation in Chinese characters. You send it to your friend. If they also have learned to read and write Chinese, they translate it back into English. If they don't know how to read and write Chinese, they find an English speaker who knows how to read and write Chinese and get it translated into spoken English. That works fine. In most cases, you can do a lot of communication and writing by translating from your spoken language into another written language and then translating back. But there are some situations in which that's not good enough for preserving speech that you wanna communicate. Because there are certain types of spoken language that depend on the particular sounds of the words in that language. Songs, poetry, magic spells, those things get broken if they're translated into another language. You lose the rhythm, you lose the rhyme, you lose the particular oral quality that is associated with the recitation of those words. So there are going to be times when as an English speaker who reads and writes Chinese, you wish you could write down a sequence of English words. But Chinese are the, is the only writing you know. That's all you've got to work with. Well, it turns out there's a way to do it. One way you could do it is you could say, you know what? I'm going to use a Chinese character to write down an English word that is the meaning that I've memorized for that character. So I'll use this character to write the English word for, and this character to write the English word to, this one love, this one stream. That's what we call semantic adaptation. You're using the character based on its meaning to write a word in your spoken language. Of course, sometimes there are gonna be words in English that don't have an exact translation in Chinese, so this won't work. But there's something else you can do, something we call phonetic adaptation. You can ignore the meanings that these characters have when they write Chinese words, and just think about the sounds when you pronounce them. So this si sounds pretty close to an S sound. Maybe you can use it for the plural suffix S in English. This yu, well, with your English accent, maybe instead of yu, you say you. <laughs> Perfect for the word you. I sounds like the pronoun I, and she sounds like the pronoun she. So through phonetic adaptation, ignoring the meanings that I've memorized, I can use these characters to write these sounds. And I can even combine them. 
So if I want to write loves, I could do a semantic adaptation of this character to write the equivalent English meaning love. And I can use this character, forgetting that it means for, and just use it for its S sound and put them together to write loves. Seems complicated, right? It's actually quite natural, and I'll prove it to you because I'm going to make you read these English sentences. So on the left, I have these characters that you've seen already. You can just quickly repeat after me the pronunciations. I, you, su, either. Okay, we won't read this. This one, she. Okay, these are English sentences that I've written for you here. They're all English. The characters are either semantically adapted, they write something with equivalent meaning, the red, or they're phonetically adapted. They write something in English that has a similar sound to their pronunciation in Chinese, that's the blue. Figure out something that makes sense in English. Who's got number one? Let's see, let's see, let's see. In the red, in the very back, what do you have? I love you. Perfect. So this I is being used in two ways. First, phonetically adapted, then semantically adapted. Very good. Once you get the first one, the others get easier and easier. Who's got number two? Raise your hand. Yes. You love ice. Great. You love ice. Yes. Americans love ice, right? We always get ice in our drinks. OK, number three. All right, you just want to do it all together? I love ice. Yes. Number four. She loves ice. OK, number five. She loves you. OK, you are reading and writing English using Chinese characters. I love you. You love ice. I love ice. She loves ice. She loves you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. OK, good. That's excellent. So, OK, now you're going to do it the other way. <laughs> let's, let's quickly read these 12 characters together. Hu, yu, ai, er, chi, yu, wo, wan. Good. Te, yao, ba, hao. OK. You would like to write the sentence, I want you to eat four fishes. <laughs> so let's see if I can do this. Um, I'm going to go here. And I'm going to go into my Chinese. OK. Someone tell me how to write the word one. Give me the number of the character that I can use to write the English word. Uh, sorry, not one. I. How am I going to write the word I? Three. Okay. Here we go. Good. How am I going to write want? Ten. Ten would work. Is there another way to write the word want? Eight. Maybe eight or eight plus nine. Want to. Want to. Yeah. Okay. So I'm going to do it that way just because just it seems more fun. OK, I want. OK, what about you? Two would work, sure. OK. Um, OK, two. <laughs> Four is a very interesting choice. It's a little different from what we've been doing, but it has happened in the history of Japanese writing. Um, you're taking the meaning of the Chinese character, which is two, and then you're using the sound to do another word that sounds like that. But let's not do that. So what are the other? Not, not yet. We can do it later. We need the word two. So let's do this one. Whoops. <laughs> 
Let's do this one. Okay, now eat. Someone I heard people saying five, right? Okay. Four. Number one, we can do that. We could also do seven. Four. There's a lot of options here. It's not a standardized system. We're still working it out. Six. Um, six is good for fish. What about fishes? Yeah, one. Okay. All right, great. Here's our English sentence. So if you read them in Mandarin pronunciation, it's not quite English, but if you're a native speaker and you know what English sounds like, you can fix them. I want to, oh, want. I want you, you, no, that doesn't work. I want you to, oh, two, okay. Eat four fish, fishes, fish four, no fishes. Okay, I want you to eat four fishes. Okay, great. You're reading and writing English in Chinese characters. It's amazing. This is just astonishing. Okay, let me get this going again. Whoops. Okay, there we go. <laughs> okay, there we go. The end. You've done it. You've learned you, everything you need to know, you already know. The, the lecture can end here. Yeah. Because, okay, the thought experiment is over, but you're probably interested in what actually happened, right? So let's talk a little bit about what really happened. So the key point, the key takeaway of this experiment is that when you memorize Chinese characters by associating a sound and a meaning with them, that's not only how Chinese people learn to read and write as they're growing up, but it's how foreign learners learn to read and write by memorizing the sounds of the Chinese language that are represented by the character and the equivalent meanings when translated into English. And that's the key that allowed people to use Chinese characters to write other languages like we just did for English. It's the foundation of what we call script borrowing, taking a script like Chinese characters that writes one language like Chinese and adapting it, repurposing it, borrowing it to write another language like English. And semantic adaptation and phonetic adaptation are the key ideas that allow it to happen. And it might seem kind of complicated, but as you saw, as you get going, it's actually very intuitive. In fact, it works so well that once people start doing it, you can send written messages to people and they'll puzzle it out even if you don't teach them what you're doing. If you looked at that sentence we just created and you think, oh, someone's writing a Chinese sentence, you try to read it, it's nonsense, it's gobbledygook. But as soon as you start sounding it out, you'll recognize English words in it and you'll figure out what's going on. These processes are natural. They're kind of automatic, even though they seem complicated to us. So it's literacy in Chinese historically that set the stage for what happened in Japan, Korea, and Vietnam. So we're going to fast forward from the invention of writing in China in the 13th century BC to the great Han Dynasty Empire in the first century BC. And as you can see, the territory has greatly expanded. The way writing looks has changed over these more than a thousand years from those very odd looking shapes that we see carved on the oracle bones into something that is now very close to what the modern script looks like. So by the time of the Han Dynasty, we've got Chinese characters looking like what we see on the right. We've got a vast expanded territory, which the imperial armies of the Han Emperor have conquered and taken under Chinese control, including what is now the northern part of the Korean Peninsula and the northern part of Vietnam, both under Chinese control in the second first centuries BC. So you have a military command set up in these areas. You have an administrative bureaucracy set up in these areas. And you need people who can read and write to serve in your administration and can also speak the local languages to talk 
to the people you're ruling over. You need scribes. You need people who are local and speak the local languages, but who are taught to read and write Chinese. And that's how you administer your empire. So in these parts of Vietnam and Korea, you have people speaking ancient ancestral forms of Korean and of Vietnamese and reading and writing classical Chinese, the written language of the time. And a few centuries later, writing spreads from Southwest Korea, we think, into Japan in the area around Nara. So that's around late fourth or fifth century. So by the time we get to the sixth, seventh century, writing is in use in all of these areas peripheral to what's modern day China. And you have lots and lots of literate people in these local areas speaking local languages. So what's gonna happen? The same thing that just happened to us in our thought experiment. For most purposes, reading and writing classical Chinese works just fine. And you do it by learning Chinese vocabulary, Chinese grammar, Chinese characters, and you memorize a sound and a meaning. But instead of memorizing a sound with an English accent and a meaning, which is an English word, like we did here. This is a different character. This is the character for the Chinese word sky in Mandarin, it's pronounced tian. So we have a pronunciation, we have a meaning. But if you were in ancient Japan, you would be memorizing a Japanese accented pronunciation. And the way you learned the meaning is you would remember a Japanese word, your native language. That means the same thing as the Chinese word. So when you are learning the Chinese pronunciation. In, in Japanese, that's called the character's on, the, um, the sound of the character. And when you're translating into Japanese to remember the meaning, that's called the character's kun, the, the pronunciation, uh, sorry, the explanation in your own language. So the character is memorized as pronounced ten and meaning ama, ama being the Japanese word for sky. And the same thing in Korea, they're doing it exactly the same way, except it's a Korean accented pronunciation, tion, and you remember it by translating into Korean, hanul, the Korean word for sky. And guess what they're doing in Vietnam? They're learning to read and write Chinese the same way, thousands of characters, and each one they're associating it with a Vietnamese accented pronunciation, tion, and a translation into Vietnamese, blei. That's old Vietnamese. That's not how it's pronounced today. So you're living in a world that is characterized by what we call diglossia. There's a high prestige language where all the reading and writing is happening. And there's a low prestige language, which is how everyone is talking to each other at home and in the streets. The high language is classical Chinese. The low language is whatever is in the area you're in. And reading and writing require translation, which is fine for most purposes. But as we just said, sometimes you need to write your own language. And it is not an accident that the earliest texts we find that are written representations of Japanese, Korean, and Vietnamese languages, not classical Chinese, are poetry. because you need the exact sequence of words. As you all know, if you've tried to translate poems, something is always lost, right? Okay, so it's not an accident that we see this pattern over and over and over again. Here, for example, is a, an old Korean text. Uh, this is a ninth century Korean language poem, which has been recorded in a 12th century historical work written in classical Chinese. So there's this whole story here in classical Chinese, but inside the story, someone sings a song. If you can read classical Chinese, a few of you in this room can, you'll probably see bits and pieces of this story that you can read and understand and kind of make sense to you. And this looks like gobbledygook. 
just like I want to eat four fishes looks like gobbledygook if you try to read it as Chinese. This shaded part is a Korean song written in Chinese characters. We're going to look at it more closely in a few minutes, and I'll, I'll, I'll read it out loud for you, too. OK, so how is it done? Exactly, exactly like we were just doing it. The typical pattern is that when you have a noun or a verb root, something that easily translates between languages, you use the Chinese character with the equivalent meaning for its semantic value to write the word in your language. And for grammatical stuff, like ing or s of English, that kind of stuff in Korean or Japanese, you use Chinese characters for their sound value only. You forget the original meaning, just like we used this character for the s end. And that's the general pattern you see in Korean, the general pattern you see in Japanese. Vietnamese is a little different, as I'll show you in a moment. Okay, so this is the basic mechanism, semantic adaptation and phonetic adaptation, but not random. Semantic adaptation for the more easily translatable roots and phonetic adaptation for the grammatical bits that are hard to translate. And of course, uh, one character might be used semantically in one sentence for one word and phonetically for another word in another sentence. Like we used I to mean love sometimes and the pronoun I at other times. Okay, so let's actually look at early writing. Um, actually, no, first we're gonna look at, look at some examples of this. Okay, so this Chinese character that we've been looking at, it was used to write the Japanese noun ama, meaning sky, semantically. It was also used to write te, the verbal suffix phonetically, because that's a grammatical bit. There's no equivalent meaning in Chinese. And just based on the pronunciation, it was used for a similar sounding Japanese syllable. Now in modern Mandarin, we pronounce this tian, but at the time, 1500 years ago, when people in Japan were learning Chinese characters, it was pronounced ten. And so it's actually pretty good for a te syllable. This character, which in modern Mandarin is pronounced jia, it means add to, in ancient times was pronounced ga in Chinese, was adapted from its meaning to write Kua, the root of goaru, uh, meaning to add, but was adapted for its sound to write the Japanese subject marker ga in Japanese grammar. And one more example. This Chinese character, anciently pronounced da, meaning many, was used to write the Japanese root o for the adjective many, but by sound also to write a grammatical bit, the past tense suffix, which sounds similar to the pronunciation of the Chinese character. Okay, here's a poem. Here's an actual text. This is the first four lines of the very first poem of the great Japanese poetry connect collection known as the Manyoshu. Seventh century collection of thousands and thousands of poems. Girl with your basket, with your pretty basket, with your spade, with your pretty spade, picking greens on this hillside. I want to ask your home, please tell me. It's all Chinese characters, normal looking Chinese characters, but it is not Chinese language. If you show this to someone who knows classical Chinese or modern Chinese, it looks like absolute nonsense, total gobbledygook. But if you were a Japanese speaker who had learned Chinese characters just like we did and wrote English sentences this way, you could read this aloud in your own language as Japanese. Um, let's, let's speak some old Japanese out loud together. So uh, I'll just say a word. Um, the W O represents an O sound. The O by itself represents an A sound. Don't worry if you can't get it. it we're, we're only approximating <laughs> old Japanese and there are no old Japanese speakers around anymore to hear us and criticize us. They're, they're, they're long dead. Okay. <laughs> Excellent. Really pretty good. You're doing pretty good. Stick with it. Okay. 
このお金になってますかいぴゃきかなのらさね。Wonderful. Okay, how is this working? How are these Japanese words getting written with Chinese characters? Let's just take a, a zoomed in look at these two, line one and line four. So in line one, we are writing komo, which in modern Japanese would be pronounced komo, with two characters to write the word basket followed by a grammatical marker that says this is the topic of the sentence. The first character writes the word for basket in Chinese. So it's being used here to write the word basket in Japanese by semantic adaptation. The second character writes the word fur, animal fur in Chinese. It's being used here just for its pronunciation because it's pronounced mo. And so it's writing a Japanese grammatical particle that matches the pronunciation. So you forget the, the Chinese pronunciation when you're reading this in Japanese for its meaning. And you forget the Chinese meaning when you're reading this for its Japanese grammatical sound value. And in line four, something very similar is going on. This writes norasane, which means tell, plus some grammatical endings that indicate you're making a respectful request. So the character that writes the Chinese word for tell is here writing the Japanese root, meaning tell. And characters writing gauze and root, which are irrelevant here, are used just for their pronunciation to write these syllables in Japanese. So you see the same thing, the, the noun or verb, and then the bit after it is written phonetically. Let's look at a Korean poem. Amazingly, it's done the same way. These are the opening four lines of the eight line poem, Song of Choyong. Ninth century poem. It's the same one I showed you earlier that was embedded in a classical Chinese text. Once again, it's absolute gobbledygook if you think it's Chinese and try to read it that way. Under a bright moon in the capital, I returned home at night from carousing. When I entered and looked in my bed, there were four legs in it. Not, not good, right? Not good. So you'll have to look up the last four lines later. I'm not going to tell you what they are. Okay. Um, just for time reasons, I'll just read this without having you all do it. So old Korean pronounced something like this. Tonggyong bulki tara, ham turi nonidaga, turaza. And we can zoom in on this. It's exactly the same thing. We can go a little faster. This is bright. It's got a root and a suffix. In Korean, the root is written with the Chinese character that matches the meaning of bright. And the suffix is written with a Chinese character whose pronunciation matches the pronunciation of the Korean suffix. And in line three, pogon, meaning C, and then the C root is written with a Chinese character that writes the Chinese word to C. And the suffix is written with a Chinese character in which we ignore the meaning of older brother and just use its pronunciation because it matches the pronunciation of the Korean suffix. Okay, now Vietnamese, and now things get a little more interesting. This is a 14th century poem. Uh, we see Vietnamese writing, writing of Vietnamese language much later than Japanese and Korean. 14th century is around when we first see it. Actually, this is a 15th century poem, probably early 15th century, by uh, one of the great, great Kore uh, Vietnamese poets, Huynh Jai. It's in vernacular old Vietnamese. But one thing you will notice here is a Chinese person who knows how to read Chinese will not only not be able to make sense of it, they're going to encounter a lot of characters in here that don't exist in Chinese, right? So something more is going on here. It's not just adaptation of Chinese characters in their Chinese form, but new characters are being created to represent the Vietnamese words. What is going on here? Um, I'm, I'm going to skip this. Uh, I actually don't know enough Vietnamese to read this well anyway, but we'll, we'll move on. Um, just for time, in line one, these two Chinese characters are used to write the word Aintam, meaning brothers, 
In Chinese, they write morphemes that mean hero and three, but those meanings are irrelevant here. Their pronunciation, the Vietnamese accented pronunciation of the Chinese matches the pronunciation of the Vietnamese word for brothers. So they're used for their sound value only. It's this character that's very interesting. This character does not exist in mainstream Chinese writing or Japanese writing today. It is a novel combination of two Chinese characters. You might remember this one. This is the number four, and we were using it for the S sound in English. And this is a Chinese character that means root, like the root of a tree. And these are writing a Vietnamese word, bong, which means four. How is this working? Well, there's a semantic adaptation of the Chinese character for four. And this character for root is pronounced almost identically to the Vietnamese word for four. It's a phonetic adaptation, but they're combined into one character. The character on top here, if you know Chinese, is telling you the meaning of the Vietnamese word being written. And the character on the bottom, if you know Chinese, is telling you the sound of the Vietnamese word that's being written. And they're stuck together, which means you can tell right away that it's writing a Vietnamese word and not something in Chinese, because this character doesn't exist in Chinese. In fact, there are lots of characters like this in the writing system called Chunom, which is the earliest form of writing Vietnamese language using Chinese characters, including these newly created Chinese character. One part adapted semantically, one part adapted phonetically, and then combined into a new character form. And there are many other graphs of this type, including quite a few in that poem we just looked at. Okay, so there's one last thing to cover, and then we will stop and take questions. And that is the problem of ambiguity. You probably already detected this when we were doing our thought experiment. When a character might be used either for its sound value or its meaning value to write your language, you can't always be sure which it is. Usually you can figure it out because only one of those is going to make sense given the way, say, English works. But while you're figuring it out, it takes some mental effort. Right? Is this love, love, love for? No, that makes no sense. Love, love, loves? No. Is it love, love, ice? No. Is it I love, loves? No. Is it I love, ice? Yes, that must be it. Okay. So if you had a way of marking or indicating which characters are being used semantically and which are being used phonetically, you wouldn't have to deal with this kind of struggle, calculating out the possibilities and deciding which is the right one. These characters eliminate that ambiguity. There's only one word this can be, something that means four and is pronounced like bon, and that's the Vietnamese word bon, meaning four. But this problem of ambiguity exists in the early Japanese and early Korean writing as well. And one other way to disambiguate is to change the shape of the characters when they're being used for their sound value. This is what happened in the history of Japanese writing. And if you only have about 100 syllables, which is what you have in Japanese, you only need at most a few hundred characters used for their sound value to write all the grammatical stuff of Japanese. And you can change the way they look so they won't be confused with all the characters you're adapting semantically to write Japanese words. And there are two ways this happened in the history of Japanese. A full character could be cursivized. In other words, written quickly with strokes combined, um, just like you might do in ordinary fast handwriting. But then you formalize it as the way you write this character when it's just being used for its sound value. Or it could be abbreviated by just taking a piece of the character. And now these look different from the full Chinese characters. And so you will never be confused about whether this is being used for its sound value or its meaning value. And this is the way modern Japanese is written today as well. The full form Chinese characters unchanged are called kanji and they write verb and noun roots. They have meaning. And the abbreviated ones are called the kana scripts and they have only sound value, just like letters of the alphabet. And they only write things based on sound in Japanese. 
So this character has a cursive form and an abbreviated form writing the sound te, this one ka, and this one mo. And the full character forms are never used when just writing sounds anymore. So whereas we saw in the first line of the manyo shu, two full form characters, one writing basket, one writing a grammatical particle. In modern Japanese, that second one would be written in its abbreviated form. And now there's no ambiguity. You don't need to guess anymore. The full character is semantically adapted. The abbreviated character is phonetically adapted. And so it could never ever be interpreted as fur and you never even have to consider the possibility. Okay, then what? Now we fast forward through many hundreds of years of history. Uh, Japanese still uses Chinese script to write Japanese language today, but it's diverged for disambiguation. The full form characters are called kanji. The abbreviated characters are called hiragana and katakana. Korean took a different path. In the 15th century, the king of Korea and his ministers invented an alphabet. And while it wasn't widely used for a long time, most reading and writing was done in classical Chinese, in the early 20th century, that alphabet basically replaced Chinese characters when writing the Korean language. And today, Korean is written almost exclusively in Hangul, the alphabet. And in Vietnam, something else happened. Westerners created a Latin script-based way of writing Vietnamese. And in the early 20th century, that script was chosen as the official way of writing the Vietnamese language. And that Chunom script we talked about earlier fell out of use and is now only known by a few specialists and academics. If you look at a modern piece of Japanese writing, <laughs> from my perspective, <laughs> um, I would look at it kind of differently than an ordinary Japanese person would because I have this historical perspective. So if we zoom in on part of this, what we see here are part abbreviated Chinese characters. <laughs> These used to be full Chinese characters. They've been abbreviated because they're used for sound value only. And here they are writing the Japanese syllables rekodo, which is the Japanese word for record, borrowed from English. Here are some full form Chinese characters used for their semantic value to write Japanese roots, words that have the same meaning as the Chinese characters do in Chinese. And here are some cursivized Chinese characters. They're used for their sound value only to write the grammatical bits after these nouns. So of course, this is not how a Japanese person learns or thinks about Japanese writing. Japanese writing can be learned today without any knowledge of Chinese or the history of the writing system. But someone like me, you know, I look at this and I just see lots of Chinese characters that have changed shape in various ways and are being repurposed in various ways. And then um, in the last few, last 100, 200 years, you get a lot more uh, Latin alphabet script thrown in to the mix along with the kanji and kana scripts in Japanese. So I have a page from the classic cyberpunk novel, Neuromancer. Um, and what you'll see here is all kinds of, you know, things that are written in, yeah, in, in the Roman alphabet, as well as all these historically derived Chinese characters. This is a modern Korean newspaper. Chinese characters are still used kind of stylistically. The head, the uh, title, the name of the newspaper is written in Chinese characters. There are one or two in the headlines. Everything else is Korean alphabet. And, and this is uh, 2006, I think. Today, even fewer Chinese characters in, in Korean writing. It's pretty much all the alphabet. And modern Vietnamese also entirely in the Latin alphabet today. So all of these languages were written in Chinese characters the first time they were written down, but only Japanese today is written in Chinese characters and modified Chinese characters. I left stuff out because, I mean, it's already 820, right? Um, um, there are very complicated histories of writing in all of these places, and I, there are experts who know about that. I'm not expert in the writing system of, of uh, the writing history of, of all these languages. There are people in this room who know the history of Japanese writing much better than me. Um, but I've provided the basic principles that show how 
a single morphographic script like Chinese can get adapted to write other languages. Even English could have been if uh, an alternative reality had presented itself. Um, and that's because, again, just to kind of hit this one to death, right? Um, if you learn to read and write Chinese, you associate every character with a sound and a meaning. And once you've got a sound and a meaning, you can use either one of those to represent any words you need to in your own language. You can translate by meaning, or you can use sound to sound out words in your own language. And that's universal. And you know, Paul mentioned that my book talks a little bit about Sumerian and Akkadian, and that's because the same thing happened. Akkadian speakers borrowed the Sumerian script to write their language, and they did it the same way. Semantic adaptation, phonetic adaptation. Then you have the potential for ambiguity. So the third thing that happens is some kind of mechanism for disambiguation to make reading easier cognitively. We've seen different methods of disambiguation. How it plays out is different in each place. In Japanese, it was done by abbreviating characters when they're used for their sound value. In Vietnamese, it was done by creating new characters through a combination of existing characters. So that's it. Phonetic adaptation, semantic adaptation, disambiguation, the inseparable triplets of morphographic script adaptation. If someone asks you what the talk was about, you can say, I learned about the inseparable triplets of morphographic script adaptation, and <laughs> no one will come to my next talk. <laughs> so um, as Paul mentioned, uh, this is my book on this topic. It's a, it's a pretty technical book. Um, not suitable for most of you, but I have a new book coming out at the end of the year, which is aimed like this talk at a general readership and goes into a lot more detail about all these things, but I hope in a fun and accessible way. And um, I do have a, a, a sheet there. If you want to get notified by UW Press, when it becomes available, you can put your name and email uh, on the table 